Good afternoon, everyone. I first want to thank everyone for taking the time out to participate in this presentation today. As we all know, disaster preparedness and response is a critical skill that public health nurses are involved in. And the more we are engaged in training, understanding the policy updates and participating in exercises, the more prepared we are when our community is faced with a disaster. Responding to a disaster is no longer an if scenario, it's when. When will the next disaster occur and are we gonna be ready? I'm sure many of you have heard the statement, if you stay ready, you will never have to get ready. And that's where we want to be when it comes to emergency preparedness. My goal is that key takeaways from this presentation are one, our VDH nurses recognize our job is not just supporting shelter operations, but we have an important role to play in all aspects of the disaster management cycle, which include mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. Two, we know where to obtain the guidance and information to inform planning and partnership building and preparation for an emergency response. And three, we integrate opportunities for education, training, and competency validation so nurses remain competent in these skills. The mission of public health, our core public health functions and essential services do not change in a disaster. Neither does the practice of public health nursing. Public health nurses are not extensions of an acute care or first responders during an emergency response. We as public health nurses should be seen like, more like first receivers. First responders are the ones that support and respond at the actual scene of an event and provide life-saving measures. And us as first receivers, we are getting those individuals and families that have fled before the event happened or are stable enough to transition to a mass care setting. We have a wide range of skills that allow us to be utilized in a variety of population-based activities during the disaster response. Some of those skills include rapid needs assessments, population-based triage, mass dispensing of prevented or curative therapies, such as vaccinations, community education, managing shelters of displaced populations, and ensuring the provision of ongoing delivery of essential public health services, even after the initial impact of the disaster and as the community is moving into recovery. When you read through the reference books, you'll find a variety of definitions for a disaster. The Red Cross and the Red Crescent define a disaster as a serious disruption to the functioning of a community that exceeds it, its capacity to cope with its own resources. The Stanhope and Lancaster nursing text defines a disaster as an occurrence causing widespread disruption, destruction, and distress requiring external assistance. Basically, a disaster is present when the population's needs exceed its resources. What I'm sharing with you now is the World Risk Index map for 2022. This is a great visual that puts it all into perspective of why we as public health nurses need to strengthen our skill set in disaster preparedness, management, and response. The risk for disasters is always there and they happen everywhere. We are seeing this play out right now with the various disasters we've seen in the US recently, uh, like Maui, uh, San Diego, and even Hurricane Adelia. This map is published by the United Nations University Institute for Environment and Human Security. This map comes with a comprehensive report published annually that systematically looks at the county, or excuse me, the country's vulnerability and its exposure to natural hazards to determine a ranking of countries around the world based on their disaster risk. The World Risk Index determines the risk of becoming a victim of a disaster as a result of a natural hazard, such as floods, hurricanes, earthquakes, for 193 countries. We need to be ready to provide support to our communities when they experience a disaster. And the best way to do this is to recognize how public health nurses are best utilized before, during, and after a disaster. Articulate this message to the leaders in your locality and stakeholders in your community. Get involved in the emergency preparedness disaster management planning. 
and find opportunities to practice skills through local community tabletop exercises, drills, or other disaster management exercises. So I hope this is not your first time seeing these documents. If it is the first time, I encourage you to download them and review. And so when you have the copy of this uh, slide deck, all of the, a lot of the images are linked to those documents. So you're able to click on those and download things as needed. Um, what is listed before you on the slide, they are the Association of Public Health Nurses position paper, role of the public health nurse in disaster preparedness, response and recovery, the International Council of Nurses core nursing uh, disaster competencies, and the Virginia Board of Nursing regulations governing the practice of nursing. These documents are essential in establishing competencies, requirements, and shaping the scope of practice for nurses providing services before, during, and after a disaster. One thing I want to stress from the APHN position paper is that it emphasizes that public health nurses have strengths in assessing the needs of populations prior to and after disasters, disease surveillance, case management, and first aid. It also affirms that public health nurses should not be simply viewed as an acute care or a hospital replacement for first responder extenders. I want to continue to encourage all of our nurses to be empowered to speak up when they believe planning and tasks assigned are outside of their scope of practice or scope of training because the goal is to protect the public and keep them safe. And we don't do that if we work outside of our scope of practice or our scope of training. The International Council of Nurses Core Competencies in Disaster Nursing document, it also focuses on knowing the ICS framework and ensuring understanding of that structure is incorporated in the knowledge base of nurses supporting disasters. The Board of Nursing Regulations give us a perspective on the scope of practice, when we can deploy a nurse to support operations, outlining restrictions on nursing and nurse practitioners practice so that even in mass care operations, we are aligned with regulatory guidance, and that's critical. We also want to ensure that whatever care is rendered, it is done ethically. So we're also guided by the American Nurses Association documents on ethical practice, including patient safety. Our goal is to provide safe care to all that enter the shelter services and to keep them stable so they don't need to go to a higher level of care. A continued reminder is that the goal is to keep the people safe for the amount of time that they're out of their normal environment. It's not about providing tertiary level of care when they're with us. Another set of documents everyone should be familiar with are the VDH emergency response documents. Uh, those include our emergency response base plan, Annex H of the emergency preparedness plan, which outlines our mass care plan, and the VDH nursing directive for sheltering services. The VDH base plan provides the structure and guidance necessary for VDH to accomplish its mission before, during, and after an emergency with the public health impact. This plan is compliant with the National Incident Management System and follows Comprehensive Preparedness Guide 101 principles. The base plan lists the general responsibilities of the VDH various offices, divisions, and departments for all hazard emergencies to include the roles and responsibilities for the local health departments. Please recognize when you are reading this base plan the roles and responsibilities listed are not an exhaustive list. Specific responsibilities will vary depending on the incident and the priorities established by the commissioner. Annex H of the emergency response plan outlines specific guidance to mass care roles and responsibilities for VDH and local health districts. It also mentions that local health districts work collaboratively with local emergency management, health and human services agencies, and other community partners to determine roles and responsibilities in providing care and public health services in a mass care setting. So when we talk about district plans and locality plans, here is one place um, where I, 
and the opportunity for nurses to contribute in the planning and preparedness of the district and the community. We need you all to be sitting at the planning table so stakeholders can understand the capabilities of public health nursing and the way to best use them during shelter operations and in an overall emergency response. The Sheltering Services Nursing Directive is derived from the guidance outlined in Annex H, as well as the APHN position paper for competencies in disaster nursing and the Board of Nursing regulations governing the practice of nursing. The document itself speaks to the scope of nursing practice in mass care settings. You can access all of these documents on the intranet page. All of our nursing staff should know where to find these documents and should have reviewed them. Effective nursing practice during any disaster requires clinical competency and a mindset of doing the greatest good for the greatest number with the least amount of harm. The way we influence that is by being deliberate in developing competencies and skill sets needed to be successful during a disaster. We should take disaster competencies seriously, just like any of our everyday practice competencies. Nurses should plan, seek out and be involved in refresher training and participate in drills and exercises to assure a maintained basic level of proficiency. The core nursing competencies are, and this one here is the 2019 update, they're organized into eight domains. As you can see, the domains are aligned with the four elements of the disaster management cycle. So we first want to ensure development of skills when addressing planning and preparation. That's ensuring there is a plan and that you are actively involved in the development of the plan. That is an involvement in the community plan, but also making sure you have a personal plan. Public health nurses must have a plan in place to address their own needs in a disaster prior to the actual disaster happening. Without addressing your own needs, there is no way you can be fully engaged with your obligations during the response. Practicing self-help is critical. Making sure you and your family have disaster kits. You should also have an established care plan for family and pets. Know who will be responsible for caring for your loved ones while you're engaged in a disaster response. I also encourage you to work with your family in disaster preparedness activities in order to strengthen their skills so that they know what to do in the event of an emergency. Disasters are becoming more common and we've seen that firsthand in the activity that's been going on across the globe over the past few months. Wildfires, hurricanes, earthquakes, et cetera. Uh, this is why now more than ever, nurses need to be part of the development of plans. This is very important to get nursing staff engaged early and often so they are familiar with the local plans and are prepared if there is a need for nurses to deploy. When operations are activated due to a disaster, nurses have to be familiar with the incident management system. Staff also need to know what is expected of them during a mass care operation and plans need to be developed so that roles and responsibilities are clear. Nurses also need to know what safe practice is and what is not safe practice. The goal is to keep those in the shelter as well and as healthy as you can while they're outside of their normal environment. Then as you progress across the disaster management cycle, we are providing opportunities so that skills can be developed so that we can properly support residents when they're unable to return back to their previous place of residence after the disaster. These competencies keep us on track in considering how the public health nurse role needs to be shaped before, during, and after disaster. The APHN position paper also references the public health preparedness and response competency map. The four arch overarching competencies, which are one, model leadership, two, communicate and manage information, three, plan for and improve practice, and four, protect worker health and safety, span preparedness, response, and recovery roles. As stated in the position paper, by combining both the International Council of Nursing Disaster Nursing Competencies 
and the public health preparedness and response core competencies, the public health nurse finds a solid platform to inform practice across the disaster cycle. The Board of Nursing outlines expectations when it comes to maintaining current competencies. The Code of Virginia explicitly states that nurses will not assume duties and responsibilities within the practice of nursing without adequate training or when competency has not been maintained. That goes for all nursing competencies. Competency and competency assessment look at, what, look at whether or not the skills, knowledge, and abilities to perform the assigned job duties are there. Competency must be assessed by staff who understands the skills and knowledge required by the job responsibilities. Beyond the documented initial onboarding and competency assessment that's done during orientation, a good rule of thumb is that competency should be assessed on an ongoing basis with documentation of such at least once every two years. That standard comes from Joint Commission. However, agency policy might dictate a more frequent assessment of competencies. So you need to consider when looking at competency is when was the last time the staff member performed this task and how do you verify competency? Competency validation needs to happen prior to the disaster or the emergency response. And this is the responsibility of the nurse manager. This is why regular training and participating in exercises is so important. These are the opportunities where staff will hone skills, establish proficiency, and this is the time where you can validate competency. As you identify and build a competency base, you should stick to aligning tasks and skills with what is outlined in the nursing directive. What is outlined in the nursing directive is within the public health nursing scope. Remember, these are tasks and skills that both our VDH nurses and MRC volunteers will be expected to do. Also, just a quick note, if there is consideration on partnering with staffing agencies, um, is that the person or agency that hires from the staffing agency is the one that is responsible for verifying the competency. But with that, I wouldn't assume that because your shelter is being augmented by staff from a staffing agency, that they are trained and ready to go. Um, make sure you're doing your own assessments and you're able to have that documented appropriately. Now we will go into some more specifics as it relates to shelter operations. Be mindful that there is no one size fits all when it comes to planning and executing shelter operations. Your plan is determined by the type of disaster you're responding to, the demographic being served, resources available, staff available, things like that. You have to be adaptable and flexible based on the conditions and factors you have in front of you. Shelter operation key concepts are listed here. Our key functions are triage, assessment, disease prevention, case management, and first aid. Nurses must remain in their scope of practice and what they can do without a physician's order. Nurse practitioners also must function within their scope of practice. Just like all nurses aren't the same, neither are our nurse practitioners. They vary in specialty and scope of practice is different. There are eight different type nurse practitioners licensed in the state of Virginia, and each type is licensed based on their educational preparation as an advanced practice registered nurse, the standards of the certifying organization with which they are certified based on their specialty. So as an example, a family nurse practitioner, um, they're able to care for populations across the lifespan. A woman's health nurse practitioner scope of practice is much more defined and very limited. These things need to be considered when you're outlining your plan and identifying what type provider is needed to write orders and replace medications for those that don't have what they need. We need everyone to carefully review the sheltering directive and share this information with community partners to both aid in planning and prevent unsafe situations in your shelter. Annex H mentions that the local health district, and that includes our nurse leaders, work collaboratively with local emergency management personnel, health and human service agencies, and other partners to determine the roles and responsibilities of providing medical care, 
and public health services in a mass care setting. So triage is a function of public health nursing. The regulations practicing the governance of nursing in Virginia describe triage responsibilities of a registered nurse, a licensed medical practitioner, or a licensed dentist. Unless a licensed medical practitioner is on site, LPN participation in triage must be supervised by a registered nurse. I believe the triage forms were updated last year, so make sure uh, to make sure that we can stay focused on a broader assessment looking at not just COVID, but flu and other communicable diseases. Annex H also includes infection prevention information to reduce the risk of disease transmission in shelters. Shelter staff must implement appropriate infection prevention and control measures. So I know the triage form is long, but also recognize that in a true emergent situation, and we need to get people assessed and inside the shelter in a timely manner, there is a rapid verbal triage section available. That rapid triage consists of a few questions on the top of the form, so you can quickly identify if it's safe and appropriate to bring that person into the shelter. Some of the questions you see up there are, do you feel healthy? Have you recently been ill or sick? Do you have a rash? Assessing if the person has a fever, cough, sore throat, or nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea within the last 24 hours. Something else we wanna know is if the person has any severe environmental, food, or medication allergies. And if yes, do they have an EpiPen? We'll talk a little bit more about EpiPens later in the presentation. Then we ask about any special medical conditions that require accommodations. This question is very helpful in providing you a better understanding of what supplies you'll need and what you'll be using and other considerations like opioid use disorder and those that might be on medication assisted treatment. Annex H addresses this type of situation and what you need to do if you have people present to the shelter with this condition. A reminder that Annex H also mentions when you are only able to facilitate getting a verbal rapid triage section complete. The remaining section should be completed when and as time allows. So you will find this algorithm in Annex H. When you start, we're gonna look at, does the individual have a medical condition requiring specialized treatment, care, or accommodations? If it's no, then they should be admitted to the general shelter population. If they do have a medical condition, are they self-sufficient? Then we can admit them to the special needs area of the shelter. When making these determinations, we also need to consider, can we accommodate their need? The goal is that the individual remains medically safe while in the shelter. If you don't think they will be, then, you need to have that discussion and consultation with the Health Department Operations Center, the HDOC, and plan to transfer that person to a higher level of care, uh, then that can be initiated. With that said, there might be a situ situation where you can't move people. Then you need to keep that person stable until you're able to begin that transfer. Another resource to note within Annex H is Attachment B and that's titled Level of Care Guidance Matrix. And this can be used as a general guide to complement the information gathered during triage and assist in deci decision making. This matrix is intended to serve as a general guide and not a substitute for medical or nursing judgment or assessment. So our HAI team has put together some recommendations to think about regarding infection prevention and control. Districts might want to take into consideration offering self-administered testing, not just for COVID, but for other respiratory infections. As you are well aware, COVID hospitalizations are going back up and we're about to transition into flu and RSV season. You also wanna take a look into considerate, consideration the level of community transmission in the area. Taking a look at all of these factors will help you determine if it's the right thing for you to do within your shelter operations. If you do consider offering testing, you need to ensure that staff are trained on running the test, 
reading the results, and disposing of the testing equipment after the test is complete. I also want you to note that people seeking shelter services should not be denied entry if they refuse testing. You will still need to obtain consent for testing for all of your um, residents. As part of your planning, you should also identify areas in the shelter that will serve as isolation and quarantine areas. It's also recommended to try and keep families together when you can. The person of concern has probably already exposed the family, so keeping the family group together really goes a long way in helping the family manage the overall anxiety that comes with being in a shelter. The picture here outlines the general infection prevention recommendations that you want to do your best to adhere to during a disaster. You can find this chart in Annex H as well. The first line of defense is screening. Those entering the shelter should be screened using the triage form. If you have time to fill out the entire form, that's great. If not, then start with the rapid triage questions and then follow up with getting the rest of the information if and when the time permits. Also remember, screening is not just for those entering the shelter. Volunteers and shelter sh staff should be screened as well. Staff working the shelter should be up to date on their immunizations. This is important because it not only protects those staying in the shelters, but also our staff and volunteers. Based on the space allocations and capacity of the shelter facility, you should also consider how to implement distance distancing strategies. Are you able to have adequate space between cots? If not, are there things that you can do to support some level of distancing when needed? As a reminder, there is a form in Annex H that can be used to monitor infectious diseases and mental health issues daily in the shelter as well. The chart also reiterates the importance of having an isolation and quarantine area. Preferably, those areas should have their own restrooms. Recognize that it is all dependent on the facility um, and how you identify um, your locations that are going to be your shelter um, locations. And if you need to be prepared to test, make sure you're aware and know the process to follow to get those items. A note about PPE use, make sure you're aligning PPE use with what is needed for the job. What you don't want to do is cause undue panic because staff are wearing gowns, gloves, respirators, face shields when the level of PPE is not needed in, that, in the shelter environment. Annex H provides guidance and links to the CDC site that outlines the PPE necessary for the different types of precautions. So if you have someone present to the shelter with the need for PPE, make sure you verify what type isolation is needed and the level PPE needed for the condition. It also wouldn't be a bad idea to have masks available for those that choose to wear them. Annex H also has links to signage templates that can be used based on the suspected pathogen. There are also links to the EPA registered antimicrobial products that are effective against common pathogens, so you know what is needed for cleaning and disinfection. When it comes to the general infection prevention guidelines, I really encourage you to take the time to read through Annex H. The outline guidance talks about strategies for assessment and placement of residents, PPE, hand hygiene, environmental cleaning and disinfection, regulated medical waste, and sharp safety. Annex H is your go-to resource. For acute injuries, we're going to first do triage. Our role is to provide first aid and life-saving measures if indicated. As you can see at the bottom of the slide, all nursing staff, meaning those folks serving in a nurse role, assigned to serve in shelters must have current BLS certification. Then you want to notify the shelter manager if immediate transport is needed. If you have someone with minor wounds and it's taken care of, you know, you've bandaged them up, things like that, then you need to ensure that care is documented in the nursing notes. There's a form you can use for that in NXH. Then as part of the continuity of care, you want to make sure that this is reported out at the next shift. Make sure that it is part of the operational cadence so you can track and monitor those
those requiring nursing care and any follow-up if needed. It's a lot harder to maintain uh, hygiene in the shelter, so you also want to monitor for infections and be aware of any conditions that might further impact wound healing. The overall goal is to keep the person as stable as possible. And the best way to support that is to allow that person to continue with their regimens that they managed at home and do that to the extent possible in the shelter. When it comes to their chronic disease management, in the shelter, we are in a supporting role, ensuring that there is a private clean space for procedures if needed. You know, do they have enough supplies with them? How can we support logistically so that they can get what they need if they're running out of supplies or don't have supplies based on how quickly they had to leave um, their home or the incident? Are we going doing our due diligence in providing a barrier-free environment? Can we link them to a primary care provider? Are we able to coordinate so that they can get replacements for medications? All of those are things that need to be considered. When you're conducting an assessment, does that person have all the supplies and equipment needed to manage their condition? If they don't have everything needed, can they remain stable? Are you able to procure things in a timely manner? Based on the condition, do the medical personnel on site have the skills and training needed to manage this patient? Another consideration, if this person remained in the shelter, would they be at risk for rapid decline? A lot of these conditions, for example, people needing tube feedings, they can manage very well with minimal assistance, and there's really no issue. All of these things should be taken into consideration when deciding whether or not to transfer an individual. This is where nursing judgment and understanding of the capabilities of staff come into play. The goal is to provide safe care in the shelter, and if that can't be achieved based on the needs of the individual and the skill set of the staff, then discussions need to be had about transferring to a higher level of care. So more and more people are using oxygen at home. There is a lot of options for those that are oxygen dependent based on lifestyle and supplemental oxygen needs. As part of planning, the locality should assess their ability to access supplemental tanks prior to exercising the emergency plan. The plan shouldn't rely on EMS to support this because they will have their own needs and requirements. If you do have people that use oxygen in the shelter, don't forget about posting signage for awareness. You also want to consider what the plan is going to be to manage smokers as well. Depending on the emergency, you might not be able to have people go outside to smoke. So just a note to self, you know, Nicorette gum might be a great contingency in those cases. There are different ways to provide tube feedings. It can be a bolus or intermittent schedule, a continuous schedule, or a mixture of the two. So depending on the feeding plan, the feeding should be delivered by, could be delivered by syringe, gravity, or feeding pump. Residents should continue to manage their tube and feedings based on the guidance of their primary care provider. It's also important to know if this is the only way the individual is getting oral intake at all. Is it just for supplemental feedings? If the tube is for all oral intake, then hydration will be extremely important. You also will need to know about their supply needs and do they have everything needed to do their feedings based on their provider's guidance. If caregivers are with them, encourage the caregivers to give uh, the feedings or help with the feedings if they're available. If someone enters the shelter with a feeding pump to facilitate feedings, then access to electricity is key. Proper access to electricity is essential overall when talking about chronic disease management. There are a lot of disease processes where you have equipment that need electricity. Make sure you keep that as a consideration in planning. Annex H does provide guidance re regarding people that come in on medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder, and they bring their medication with them. Medication should be in a locked box, 
and given to shelter staff that will store the medication with other pharmaceuticals. All opioid treatment programs are instructed to give each patient a letter from the program physician to be placed with the medication stating the individual is a patient at the identified clinic. While keeping the medication secure, you also want to make sure they do have access to the medication when appropriate and be mindful that this treatment is restricted. That if this treatment is restricted, individuals may seek out illicit opioid to avoid experiencing withdrawal. It is encouraged to have naloxone in shelters. Make sure staff are trained to deliver naloxone. It should be easy to dispense to staff, um, but they have to have documented training. Staff who have been trained in the use of naloxone may administer the medication to individuals who are believed to be experiencing an opioid overdose. Naloxone must be dispensed to individual staff members and cannot be placed in stock shelter bags or first aid kits. Local health districts should work with their partners in advance to determine who should be responsible for having the naloxone available. Here are some considerations regarding epi auto injectors. First, you want to understand the expectation on who is responsible for bringing the epi. If you have EMS on site at your shelters, they should have it available. If you don't have EMS on site, then the expectation of the locality might be that you as the health department will bring it. If you're going, if you're going to going to make sure that they are in date and they're not expired. Also remember to have both formulations, um, an auto injector for adults and one for children. It's also recommended that you carry two of each because sometimes a single dose of epinephrine may not be enough to treat a serious allergic reaction before seeking medical care. Depending on the size of your shelter, you might consider having more than one kit. Make sure staff are trained on how to use the auto injectors. Don't assume that staff will know what to do in an emergency and make sure you document the training. Also think about if clinical operations and or pod point of distri uh, distribution operations will occur in addition to the shelter operations. Then you need to make sure you have supplies to cover all activities happening in your shelter location. The take home message here is that you make sure this is discussed during planning and the health department and the locality are on the same sheet of music on who brings this to the site. As we are engaged in shelter planning, we also need to be cognizant of those segments of the population that will need other considerations because of disabilities. When thinking about the shelter environment, you want to offer orientation and wayfinding assistance to people who are blind or have low vision. Until they become familiar with the shelter layout, blind people and those with low vision may have difficulty locating different areas of the shelter. Even after they are oriented to the shelter environment, changes in furniture layout or the addition or removal of cots may be disorienting to people who rely on these landmarks to find their way around. When they arrive at the shelter, people who are blind and those with low vision may need assistance orienting themselves to the shelter layout and locating pathways to sleeping areas, uh, toilet areas, and other areas of the shelter they may wish to use. Offer, but do not insist on providing the orientation and wayfinding assistance. Some people who are blind or have low vision need such assistance. Others can and prefer to find their own way. Also think about how you will maintain accessible routes. Cots and other furniture need to be placed to ensure that accessible routes, routes that people who use wheelchairs, crutches, or walkers can navigate can connect all features of the shelter. So for instance, accessible routes need to connect to the sleeping areas, to the food distribution areas, to the dining quarters, to the toileting area, bathing facilities, activity areas, et cetera. You also wanna eliminate protruding objects in areas where people can walk. 
Furniture and other items should be positioned to direct pedestrians who are blind or have low vision safely away from overhead or protruding objects. This requirement extends beyond the accessible route and applies throughout the shelter environment to any place where a person can walk. You also want to consider low stimulation or stress relief zones. The stress from the noise and crowded conditions of a shelter, combined with the stress of the underlying emergency, may aggravate some conditions such as autism, anxiety disorders, or maybe even migraine headaches. Without periodic access to a quiet room or a quiet space, some people with disabilities may be unable to function in a shelter environment. So identifying a space like a classroom or a private office within your facility can provide the necessary relief from noise and interaction that some shelter residents will need. You also want to consult the residents with disabilities regarding the placement of their cots. Some individuals might have needs that require accommodations when as assigning a cot uh, location. For instance, a person who uses a wheelchair uh, or a walker may need a cot located close to an accessible um, toilet area. Since an assigned cot may not be a identifiable by touch, a blind person may need a cot placed in a location that he or she can e easily find. A person with low vision may need his bed close to light so that they can see or away from bright light because it aggravates their eyes. Likewise, someone who is deaf or hard of hearing may need a cot placed away from visual distractions that would prevent them from sleeping. Another important capability you want to have in the shelter is having folks skilled and trained to manage a mental health crisis. Definitely consider training staff in mental health first aid. The training helps you assist someone experiencing a mental health or substance abuse related crisis. In the course, you learn risk factors and warning signs for mental health and addiction concerns, strategies for how to help someone in both a crisis and non-crisis situation, and where you can turn to in, for help. I would like to encourage you to work on that partnership with your DBHDS folks so that you can have folks available to intervene if needed. Also remember that those with mental health conditions can deteriorate quickly in this type of environment. Recognizing this, you know, stabilizing medications in this situation should be seen just as critical as other stabilizing medications like insulin. If you go into the internet under the training tab, you can link to more information about upcoming mental health first aid trainings across Virginia. Our workforce development and training team has partnered with various community service boards to share upcoming tra trainings and train. You'll probably see more older adults using shelter services because we have more elderly being cared for at home and we have more people living at home longer. A common issue seen is managing hydration. Usually you will see elderly people on a lot of medication, diuretics, dealing with chronic diseases like diabetes or hypertension can dehydrate quickly. So you want to encourage hydration um, and the things that they wanna drink. Also be mindful of cot placement since they might need to use the restroom more frequently and are the restrooms configured so that they can get on and off the toilet easy. The loose skin uh, integrity and the aging process also makes our older adults susceptible to pressure injury. Additionally, older skin takes longer to heal where there are injuries or bumps and bruises. So you also might wanna think about having incontinent supplies if you have a larger older population as well. When you think about the incontinent supplies, you also wanna make sure you think about disposal and waste processes to manage it. Bariatric resident considerations are also important. You wanna assess the availability of resources, the weight of an extremely obese resident. You really should know the weight loading capacity and dimensions for medical and shelter resources to determine whether they are adequate for extremely obese clients. During triage, you wanna recognize individuals who may have recently underg undergone bariatric surgery and be aware of their dietary needs. Depending on their time since the bariatric surgery, 
individuals may be placed on a special diet, maybe a, a liquid food diet, a soft food diet, um, to prevent them from uh, dealing, having to deal with side effects and complications following their surgery. And so we need to be cognizant of that. Always prioritize the safety of staff. Staff need to consider personal health and safety when providing support to bariatric patients and residents. Adequate preparation for supporting extremely obese clients will reduce the risk of serious injury for the staff and the resident as well. You also want to be aware of behavioral health considerations. Even in normal conditions, extremely obese people experience depression, social isolation, uh, and the loss of self-esteem associated with traumatic experiences due to their weight and the stress induced from disasters and public health emergencies may exacerbate some of those pre-existing behavioral health con conditions. Staff must be cognizant of the sensitive nature of obesity and consider behavioral health needs as part of caring for extremely obese individuals. So here are the key takeaways. Know your community de demographic beforehand. Extreme obesity affects nearly 9% of the U.S. population. Understanding the prevalence of obesity in specific communities is the first step to ensure that you are prepared among responders, staff, and the community so that you can address the management and logistical requ requirements of the extreme obese. You also want to educate your staff on bariatric care. Obese individuals often feel mistreated, forgotten, and misunderstood by medical and non-medical personnel. It's important for our staff to remain non-judgmental and to be able to preserve the dignity of individuals during public health emergencies and disasters. You also want to assess your existing equipment. Identifying the weight capacity and size limits of the resources and equipment will help determine whether existing equipment is appropriate for the care of bariatric individuals. So there are definitely some logistical challenges if you have to manage a point of distribution activities in the same vicinity as your shelter services. You really want to stay away from setting up a pod in the general population shelter area. The same if you have to do a testing event. In the planning phase, you want to make sure that you're thinking infection control as well. Also, don't forget about staff training. Staff have to be trained to deliver whatever treatment or vaccine is being distributed. In Annex H, you can find a template for nursing notes. Any medical or care documentation must be stored like any other patient record. Retention of the files is determined by the client's age and the procedure done. Information doesn't need to be put into web vision, but there needs to be a local process outlined on how the records will be stored. They must be kept under the retention schedule from the Library of Virginia. Work with your DSS partners to case manage individuals as you are closing down services. What we can do is provide case management for those in programs under VDH. So for an example, linkage to WIC so families have what they need to get to their next phase of recovery, which might not be at home. Uh, we also might have PrEP clients that need medication and a warm handoff for continuity of care. Um, perhaps they might be TB clients uh, who will also need that similar type of warm handoff. We can also conduct LTSS screenings, and you want to leverage your DSS partners to be able to do that uh, collaboratively. You also need to think about where you will put people that are in isolation and quarantine that can't return home. There needs to be a plan in place if they can't return home. Managing personal stress and being aware of staff stress during a disaster response is critical. First, it is necessary to protect the well-being of individual staff members and teams and the community that they work with. Second, managing stress is an important priority because it allows us to successfully fulfill our obligations as an agency. Lessons learned from previous disaster operations is that the staff with the least amount of training and preparation really struggle. Training and expectation management go a long way in stress management. Exercising your local plans and taking the time to participate in drills and training 
keeps people focused and in the ready. The Responder Stress Continuum Chart is a tool that you can use to facilitate self-awareness and team awareness. I encourage you to use this as a communication tool to check in with your team so that you can assess stress impact. The longer you have a shelter open, these type check-ins become essential. Encourage your team to speak up and be transparent about how they feel and where they believe they are on the continuum. And make sure you have a plan on what your action steps will be as a nurse leader based on where they say they are in the continuum. Responding to disasters can be both rewarding and stressful. Knowing that you have stress and coping with it as you respond will help you stay well. And this will allow you to keep helping those that are affected. What are some things that you can do to help your, um, to help you manage stress during a disaster response? Here are a few things listed here um, on the slide. Shift should no more, or should be no more than 12 hours. Longer shifts increase the risk for burnout, injury, and errors. You wanna limit working hours to no more than a 12 hour shift. You wanna work in teams and limit the amount of time working alone. Uh, also write in a journal just so that you can get things out, get them on paper and kind of release some of the feelings that you're having. Also talk to your family, friends, supervisors and teammates about your feelings and experiences. Practice breathing and relaxation techniques. Maintain a healthy diet and get adequate sleep. Know that it is okay to draw boundaries and say no. I encourage you to really take time out and practice these techniques. They really will um, bring a lot of benefit when managing stress in a high stress environment. Please remember you can't pour from an empty cup. You have to take care of yourself even if you are part of a disaster response. It is not selfish to take breaks. The needs of residents are not more important than your own needs and well being. We deploy and serve as a team. So remember that there are other people who can help in the response. You are not expected to do it all and carry the load on your own. And working all the time does not mean you will make your best contribution. You can't be at your best when you are stressed, sleep deprived, disengaged, and anxious. You have to take the time to take care of yourself and collectively let's be there for one another so that we can get through the disaster together. I thank you all for your time and support during this presentation. And I hope you are able to take away a couple of things that will really help you uh, during your planning, before, during, and after uh, a, an emergency response. Thank you so much.